come from there many years ago. I've been in Queensland for now for 20 plus years. But uh, still Barrack New South Wales in the football. Like I know most of you do, I'm sure. Amen. All right, take the Bible to Psalm chapter 3. Psalm 3. We'll look at uh, something hopefully that will be a help to you and a blessing to you. As I'll, I'll read the, the psalm. It's quite short. It's only eight verses. <clears throat> then I'll pray. And then um, we'll have a look at some of these verses this morning. So Psalm 3 says, Lord, how are they increased that, that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousand of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O oh my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Seal up. I'm going to pray and ask God to help me this morning. I'll ask God to help you as well. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for this church. Thank you that the opportunity has arisen where I can preach again. Lord, as we look into Psalm 3 and, and encourage us some thoughts, I pray you'd help me to deliver it in, in a simplistic way and in a way that can be easily understood. And Lord, as we look at these verses, may they speak to hearts and help and encourage this morning. Uh, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, Laurel and I got the opportunity to have, um, have some coffee with a lady from our church and just to encourage her a little bit. She'd been struggling with some things and, uh, you know, life situations do come along that make us feel low, make us feel discouraged, make us feel like uh, things are going against us and we can feel overwhelmed. And I was thinking about Psalm 3, I prepared this message several years ago and I was looking through it and I guess it really kind of made sense with the circumstances of this week. So I thought, as I'm sure each one of you may have gone through things in your life that have brought you low, or maybe even at this very moment might be going through something, I hope this will help you to, I guess, put your mind and your thoughts in the right place and on the right person. Who can help you? I know myself, I've gone through times where, where life can throw a curveball at us and situations will arise, circumstances will change, and it feels like uh, you're going through some terrible things and, and life can bring you pretty low. Now in Psalm 3, we see this psalm is about David. David finds himself uh, in a situation that brings him very low as well. Now I want you to think about this, David is the man who, as you read through your Bible, um, had some things go very good for him. I want you to think about this, David was the man who was brave enough to go up against Goliath. Now, he was the man who, when no one else would, was brave. He took the challenge, with God on his side, went out to fight a giant, with the whole nation on his shoulders, defeated Goliath. This is who the man who was crying out to God now because things are tough in his life. Um, in, let's have a look in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18. I just want to read a, a couple of verses for you to kind of set the scene of, of who this David was. David was a man who in 1 Samuel chapter 18, he rocketed into fame with all the people. 1 Samuel 18. I want you to have a look in verse 5 to 7. So David has beaten Goliath. Verse 5 says, And David went out with us wherever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him, uh, set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So he was someone who was, who was very accepted amongst the people. Verse 6, And it came to pass as they came, and David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, 
that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tablets, with joy, and with their instruments of music. So it was like a ticket tape parade. It was, it was a great fanfare. And then verse 7 says, And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. David was a man who was not only brave, but he had shot to fame amongst all the people of his, of his city and of his country. He was a man who was very popular. The Bible tells us also that this is the same David who was the one that was going to be anointed to be the king over Israel. So many amazing things that David went through. And then in, in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 12, there's an interesting verse where it says, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. This is the same man who had God's blessing on his life. So this man, David, was a man who had quite a lot of things go well for him, had positioned him to be one of the greats of the kingdom. And yet in Psalm 3 we hear him saying, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are those that rise up against me. Here's David in such a low place in his life. You know, your life can be going really well. You can have so many good things happen for you. Life can be at its sweetest. Finally got that job that you've been looking for. You've got income coming in. You're settled in, in home. You're settled in church. You've got uh, people that you connect with. You have that, you have that social... I guess interaction with church members, friends from work, family members, and things can be really good. You finally got good health. And then very quickly you can find that can all change just through simple circumstances. David found himself at one of those low times in his life. And it's interesting, someone so good, so favoured, things going so well can end up so low. And this morning I want to I just want to go through Psalm 3 and have a look at David's thinking, where he was looking at, why he was that way, and then how he got through it and the end result. And through that, I hope that this can be a help and a blessing to you. First thing I want you to notice in Psalm 3, in the first couple of verses, was David's problem. David's problem. He's, I'll read the first verse, two verses for you again. Lord... How are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Now for David, he had people that were causing him problems. You know, there are many problems that can come in life, but I think it's the people problems that can be the most hardest to get through. A health problem can be hard, but we know often, I'm not always, but often through seeking medical advice, sometimes through treatment, sometimes through medication, sometimes those health things can be dealt with. Financial difficulties can be a problem, but we know through uh, hard work, through uh, saving, through making good choices, some of those things can be, can be solved and dealt with. But when it comes to people problems, they can be the most difficult because sometimes, no matter what you do, if that other person is against you and never changes, that burden can always be there. I've had, I've had problems with people. People always have problems with me. Every time I open my mouth, people just shake their head, they think, oh. But people problems can be one of the toughest things. And this is where David finds himself. One of the main issues for David was his son Absalom. If we know um, our Bible well enough, we know that, that Absalom caused David a whole lot of trouble. Um, I guess to remind you of the story, Absalom was, was David's son. And it all started when, um, when one, of, one of David's other sons, Amnon, forced and, and raped his stepsister. Tamar, which was a bad thing. Absalom got, got, he got wind of what was happening and Absalom caused the death 
of animal. Of course, the great um, bad thing, and Duggan was obviously greatly upset about that, about the whole situation, and then Absalom fled. Absalom, Absalom left. And it seemed his son Absalom caused a great distress upon everything. And then a couple of years later, Absalom came back and things were never really dealt with, but Absalom was received back into, I guess, the city. And over the, over the course of time, because nothing was ever dealt with, Absalom started to win the hearts of the people. Let's have a look in, in 2 Samuel chapter 15. I want to have a look at what he actually did. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And we're going to read... Let's start reading in verse 1. And it came to pass after this, this is 2 Samuel 15, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is, is one of his of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said it unto the, sorry, and Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man, no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and, and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom stood in the way when people were coming to see the king for help and for judgment, seeking the king's counsel. And Absalom got in the way of these people and said, hey, listen, I can help you out. I can be the one who can, you know, if I was my judge, I reckon I could help you. And people started to listen to Absalom, and very slowly, as more people came, Absalom, I guess, he got in their favor. And the Bible uses the term, he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Who did he steal them from? From the king, from David. David's now king, and, and Absalom, his, his son, was going behind his back and winning the confidence, winning the hearts of the people. And as we will find in, in verse 13, the Bible says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are, are after Absalom. It's now reported that, that the people will now have confidence more in Absalom than they do in you. And then notice what happens in verse 14. And David, and David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee. David was now in, in great distress because of what had happened, because he now realized that there wasn't as much confidence in him as were with his son, his son Absalom. He's now fleeing, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. So, so, we, can, so we can kind of see what's happening. David, who is king, things are going well. Things were not dealt with with Absalom. He's now back in town, and very slowly, Absalom is now gaining momentum within, within the nation. And the men of Israel are now putting their confidence because of how Absalom displayed himself, he was, very, he was very confident. And he stole, very subtly stole the hearts of the people. So much that when David heard about it, David felt very fearful enough that if he didn't flee, he thought there was enough people to be against him that Absalom would have him killed as well. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in a position of authority in and my son, now, now some, of you met, some of you met my son last week. He's very tall. Um, he's, he's 18. He's a bit stronger than me now. He's grown. He's, he's, he's a solid lad. 
Now, if Tim suddenly went behind my back and, and, and gained the confidence of the men in our church and, and someone said, hey, your son Tim is now the best song leader in church and he's out for your position. What? No! I've got to flee. And my life is now in distress because I'm out of a job, I'm out of, I'm out of my ministry, I'm out of doing what I want to do and what I feel like God wants me to do, I have to leave. Now, in tongue and cheek, I say that, but what about at work when, when, when someone goes behind your back to steal your position and the boss comes and says to you, listen, you're fired. And you're like, what's happened? I was fine the other day and you find out someone's been telling rumours about you and lying about you and the bosses believe them and oh, income's gone. Things happen. Um, people problems are some of the worst. And this is where David finds himself so low because now he has to flee. His kingdom is in disarray. Wow. People who cause trouble. Do you have someone who's causing you trouble in your life? Thankfully at the moment, I can't say there are too many people causing me great distress, but I know there have been. What about people who have nothing good to say? I'm sure we all have people like that in our lives where this, that, that they always have nothing good to say. Let's have a look in 2 Samuel chapter 16. There's a guy here that who doesn't have any doesn't have any nice kind words to say about David. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 5. Here's a guy by the name of Shimei. And when David and when King David came to Baharim, uh, Baharim. Behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. And he's a guy from the family of the previous king, who obviously didn't like David becoming king, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. I don't know if I've ever had anyone come out cursing at me and swearing at me and, and blatantly, very verbally abusing me about things. And he cast stones at David. So not only did he verbally come out and speak out, but he physically got stones and, and threw. Has anyone ever had stones thrown at them? Just trying to think back my head. I've thrown stones at people, but I've never had them thrown at me. I remember once I, um, my younger brother, we were down a river, and we used to um, throw stones at each other. We try to skip stones at each other. And my younger brother one day, I threw a stone at him and the stone skipped right in front of his head and got him right in the face and I knocked him out completely <laughs> as he floated down the river head first. Uh, that was probably one of the three or four times I nearly killed my younger brother. Um, but yeah, I, I've thrown stones at people and I've caused some damage unfortunately, but I've never had anyone thrash, physically throw stones. But David, he's, this is what David is facing. This is why he's so low. So this man cast stones at David and had all the servants of the king. Now he's throwing the throne that of everybody. David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned and and the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, my son, and behold, thou art taken in thy, in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. So he's a man who, who's come out and he's, he's cursing David. He's physically doing things to upset him. And pretty much the things he said are not true. David never, by blood, um, took the throne off of, off of King Saul. That wasn't true. Um, so David's now suffering these bad things can you imagine you trying to put yourself in David's shoes how would you feel as you were threatened as you were defamed so to speak and saying this is why Absalom stole your throne and this is why the confidence is, is in Absalom and, 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 and this is God's judgment on you and some tough things going on for poor old David. So David certainly had some problems. And as you have problems in your life, I want you to reflect 
on Psalm 3. This morning I texted the lady who, whom Laurel and I had coffee with. And I said, I want you to read through Psalm 3. I said, I'm preaching on this today. And I believe this will help you. Because David, similar to you, found himself in a situation where he, he got very low. Life running, life hiding, people against him, things not going how you thought it should be. And we can feel so low. So down to the point where we just don't know what to do. I know I've been pretty down. Feeling like no one understands. Feeling like I don't know who to talk to. Feeling like, how does God even, how can he help? Sometimes our thinking gets a little bit skewed. Our thinking gets out of whack. And I think David's initial thoughts were, Lord, so many people are against me. Many there be which save my soul. There's no help for him in God. Maybe he's even thinking, can God really help me? But let's notice what happens. The thing that I like about what David did, he didn't, he didn't tantrum. He didn't try to take matters into his own hands. David went to prayer. The second thing I want you to notice is David's prayer. So we, look, so we looked at, at David's problems. It's funny, last week my outline was all peace. Guess what, today's peace as well. I must be a P person. Must be because I'm a Paul person. So David's prayer, Psalm 3, verse 3 and 4. He said, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. He says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. David found this is a perfect opportunity to lay myself before, um, before the Lord, express what I'm feeling, let God know how I'm feeling. Because I think David knew if he did that, God could be the one that could sustain him. And before I get into this point, I want to encourage you this morning. As you go through times of difficulty, as you go through times where you get upset, or things are not going well, or Things throw you, or life throws you a curveball that you didn't expect. And you're just thinking, and, and your first reaction is, why? That seems to be a natural default thing. Why is this happening? Let me encourage you. The first thing that you want to do is tell God about it. Turn to God. I will be honest. I'm learning ever so subtly that the times I get all flustered or I get upset about things and I start thinking over things and trying to figure it all out myself I get more frustrated but the moment I stop and I decide okay, just stop I can't fix it right now the moment I turn to God and say God, what, what do I need to learn and God I want to know about this. I need your help. Very quickly, my attitude changes. And the way I view what's going on changes. And I start to think, okay, if I can only do certain things. And if I do those things, God needs to take care of the rest. And you know what I find? The things that I was so flustered about, my whole, my whole attitude about it changes. And that it's not as big as I thought it was. And God has then the opportunity to start working in it. So if this is the only thing you get out of this whole message, the thing I want you to understand is take it to God in prayer. Allow God to work in your mind so you can clearly see what's going on. And then give, give God the opportunity to do what he needs to do. Because through the hard things in life, God, that's when God often works the most in you. We might think, well, God needs to fix that person, or God needs to change that person's mind. Remember we're talking about people problems. We might even pray, God, change them, fix them. And it might be God saying, no, I'm going to show you something that will fix you, that will change you. But until we stop and start praying, we can never get changed the way God wants us to, because we're not ready to receive that change. So let's have a look at David for what he does. He prays to God. He starts out in verse 3. He says, but 
thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You know, God is our shield. And David recognized this. I started thinking about the thought of a shield, what it is. And when you think of a physical shield, you might think of maybe someone with armor and war. A shield can be a protector <coughs> against, the, against the arrows, against the swords, against the enemy. A protector guards us from those immediate troublesome elements that come along. Don't the Bible talk about the shield of faith? We can withstand against the fiery darts of the wicked. Put on the shield of faith. God is that person when we go to him in prayer and we trust in him, he can become that, that shield for us. He's the one that, that can protect us. He's the one that even in the background we can't see, I'm sure God's protecting us even now. Have you ever thought about that? We, we sit in the comfort of, of a nice quiet building and, and uh, nice soft pews and we're comfortable, we don't see any, anything going on. But maybe in the background, maybe, maybe God's holding back people. Maybe God is holding back the attitudes of the neighbours and, and within the community. Things we don't see, God is that protector for us. I think about a shield and I think of it being as a shelter. As a shelter. A shield can, can give us a little bit of comfort. Just like a house gives us comfort of shelter. I think about we're in this building. This building gives us a little bit of comfort. It gives us shelter from the rain, from the sun. It does get hot outside. But this, this building is like a shield for us. It, it not only protects us, but it gives us shelter. And God can be that very shelter that we need to run to when things are not going well. As we pray to God, we're like running to, to God to give us that shelter. I think of a shield as also a screen that, that nothing can get through to us that God hasn't already screened first. I want you to think about everything that comes into your life, God allows to come through. God screens it. Satan can't do anything new that God hasn't allowed first. Every bad thing, every hard thing, every trying thing, God, God screens it and God allows us to come through and God knows that, that we can get through it. God knows that we can learn from it. God knows we can grow through it. And God uses those things. He screams those things and says, yes, that can come through because it has an impact for good on our lives. God as a shield for us is that and, and so much more. But David says, Lord, you're a shield for me. You're the thing that I can trust in. He also says in, in verse 3, he says, you're my glory. He puts, he gives the right, uh, um, the right thinking towards God. God is our glory. You know, men find glory in a lot of things. Men find glory in fame. Men find glory in their, in their money, in their, in their occupation, in the things um, that they can do. You might be able to sing. I'm better than everyone here in the room. And, you might find glory in that, that, that it makes you feel good and it lifts you up and you feel magnified in it. But you know who David found his glory in? And that's God. God is our crown, is, is our crown in glory. He should be the one who receives our main focus. Our focus shouldn't be on us. Our focus shouldn't be on what we can do. Our focus shouldn't be on, on what we can achieve. Our focus should be on the God of heaven. I want to encourage you this morning to put God in his right place in your thinking. How do you see God in your life? Who is God to you? Have you ever, there are so many things in our Christian life that we just go through the motions of Christianity and we never ever seem to stop and consider the reality about God in our lives. Where is God in, uh, in your perspective? Where does God lie? Is God, we know God exists, so okay, so that's a benefit, that, that's a plus. But is God just some far off being who we just go to on a Sunday? Is he that far off being that we know when things go bad we just pray to him? Or is God the very, our very focus and we have God in the right position that he is our glory? 
How many times have you thought about God this week? How many times have you thought about God this morning other than sitting here in church? Did you consider God when you were getting ready? Did you consider God as you, as you were driving here? Did you, have you considering God now? God needs to be the focus because he is our glory. He's the one that, that makes us who we are. So David had a right perspective about God. He says, you're my glory. And he says, you're the lifter up of my head. I know every time that I felt down and sad or discouraged, you know, who's ever come to church a bit discouraged? I have. Have you? I want you to think about it. Maybe you've been discouraged today. When you come to church, when you're discouraged, did you walk up? How is it going to run? I'm so glad to be here. Oh, praise the Lord for church. Most of us are normally, when we're discouraged, when we walk into church, our heads are normally down. We don't want to make right contact with people because we don't want people to know things are not quite good. We don't want to have to, when someone says, how are you going? We don't really want to say, oh, everything's great. But then we don't want to have to spill the beans about, about what's really going on. So we often fake it. We often wing it a little bit. But often our heads are often down. Now as brethren, if we're, if we're doing what, what God wants us to do, how we're supposed to exhort one another and be aware of what's going on, we'll often notice a brother or sister whose head is down. We notice when, when their attitude is in its normal. For me, I am normally, I've learned to be a bit more, uh, especially within the comfort of my own church, I will be the jokester. I will be the person who, who makes people laugh. But if Paul comes in the church and Paul's not being me, it's very obvious when something's on my mind. It's very obvious when Paul's not normally like that. And it, it may be the same with you, but our head, our mindset is often focused down. We're not normally focused on God when things are down. But you know what God can be? God can be the lifter up of my head. I kind of picture in my mind when a young boy or a young girl is having a bad day. They've been at school, they've gotten in trouble, they haven't done what they've been told, and they've, they've, they've been in trouble, and they come to mum and dad and, they, and they're very low. You know what mum and dad does? Son, look at me. Forgive you, everything's good, just dealt with it, be encouraged. And it's like we physically have to lift their head up and let them know everything's good. Let them know we love them. Let me know, let them know that, that we don't hate them. That everything will be okay. We can help them. Things are good between us. You know what God does? When we're down, things are against us, we have evil problems. We don't know what to do. We say, God, you're really God. I need your help. And it's like we've, we've explored every option. We've explored every option. I've tried to fix it myself. I've gone to the person. I've been, I've been nice to them. I've tried to follow what the Bible says. I, I, and it's still not working. They still hate me. Things are not going well. And God, I don't know what to do. And it's like God comes along and he says, Son, everything's all right. I will help you with this. I'll take over. I will show you what you're going to do. I will work in that person's heart. You just keep your eyes focused on me. You keep me as your glory, and I'll work you through this. And I'm glad God does that. Because if we didn't have someone to come and lift up our heads, I'd hate to be continually walking around as a Christian with my head low. I'm glad God is there to pick, pick up my head. He's the lifter up on the head. He's that, he's that encouragement. And then we notice in verse 4, David finally says, I cried out unto the Lord with my, with my voice. You know what? We can pray in our minds. We can call out to God. And I do that often. I'm driving, you're walking. And I want to say, God, as God brings someone to my mind, 
I really try and do that as God brings someone to mind. And sometimes I don't know why they're in my head, but I'll say, God, can you I bring this person before you? If, if I know of a certain situation, I'll, 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 I'll mention that situation. But sometimes I'll just say, God, I, I don't know why that person's in my mind, but I pray for them that you'll help them, whatever they're going through. So we can do that in our minds. But sometimes it's good to verbalize things and say, God, I just need your help. I just need you, Lord. This is what I'm going through. Not that God needs to hear our voice, but sometimes it just, I guess, adds a little bit more, a little bit more emphasis to things. And notice what David says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and it says he heard me. Out of his holy hill. Aren't you glad that you have a God who hears our prayer? That's one of the, the greatest blessings of being a Christian that the world doesn't have. When we pray, God hears. God hears. Now it blows my mind how God can hear everybody's prayer at once. Just, just does my head. I'm, I'm not God. If you all started speaking here once, even just a small congregation we've got today, I'd be like, stop! One at a time. And I'm only human. But God hears, well we can all pray today, and God can hear every single individual prayer. Not only can he hear it, but he can understand what you're going through. And guess what? He can answer every single prayer at once. How good is that? And that's our God. We have the, we have the, uh, I guess the assurance that God hears us. You know, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God says, uh, I think it says, I call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Imagine that. Call unto me. He says call and I'll answer and I'll show you. If you're having people problems today, my advice to you is just stop and call unto God. And he's promised to show you what you need to do. He's promised to show you not only what you need to do, but great and mighty things that you didn't even know could be done. Listening to God is one of the greatest things of, that we can do. Psalm 46, we're in Psalms, might as well have a look at that verse. Psalm 46, a very well-known verse, very well-known passage. Psalm 46, verse 1 to 3 says, God is our refuge and strength. Notice this, a very present help in trouble. That's something David learned. When he was in trouble, God was a very present help in that trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. We're not going to fear, and that's the next part of what we want to look at this morning. When David prayed, and he understood that, that God would hear him, and God can help him, and God was going to help him. Notice what it says in verse, in verse 5 and 6. He says, I laid me down and slept. <sighs> that sounds very serene and peaceful. I laid me down and slept. I waked, for the Lord sustained me. And he says, I'm not, I won't be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me around about. You know, one of the greatest things, the greatest blessings that God can bestow upon anybody that's going through a hard time is that God can give peace. David's peace. Who's ever spent many hours during the night awake because I just can't sleep because of what's going on? That's me. If I can go to bed late, not thinking, okay, often I'll wake up in the middle of the night, I'll go to bed later, so that way I'll sleep all through the night. Doesn't matter what time you go to bed, it could be one o'clock in the morning. Sometimes by two or three o'clock you wake up and you start thinking about what's happened the day before. You start worrying. Oh, why did they say that? What did they mean? What did that brother mean when he said something obscure? They don't normally say that. 
Don't they like you? Do they like me solidly? Your brain says all sorts of things. You, you start thinking the oddest things. They want to take over my ministry because they, because they sat in their other pew that they normally don't sit in. You, you, you'll be surprised what your brain will conjure up when things, we, we make up things in our minds about people and sleep is the first thing, one of those things that is taken away from us. You know what happens when we leave things to God, when we trust God about things? God gives us peace that we can sleep all night. I remember very clearly one night, I think it was a work issue, big thing at work, and I couldn't sleep. And normally when I can't sleep, when there's an issue, isn't it funny that you go over and over and over the same thing for hours, trying to figure out why that took place firstly, what I'm gonna say the next day about it, how I'm gonna fix the problem, then you get finished and then what, guess what happens? You start thinking why that happened in the first place, why that thing happened, what I'm going to do about it, how I'm going to it. And it's like this never-ending cycle and you think, oh, you know what I did one night? I got to the point where I was just like, I could not sleep and I was just, every time I tossed and turned and I tried to sleep, bang, it would be there again. I purposely took the time to say, God, I can't do anything about this right now. I need your help. I can't stop thinking about this. Can you please change my mindset? Allow my mind to stop so I can sleep. I need to sleep. You know what happened? Very quickly, my mind stopped. And I slept. When you're struggling with something, cry out to God and allow God to work. And that's what David found. He, he found some peace. He says, I laid, I laid me down and slept. And then the next thing he says, guess what? I woke up and, and for the Lord to stay me. I went to sleep and didn't wake up once until morning. He helped me. In Philippians chapter 4, in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4, we'll read the verse. with the thought of prayer and God's peace. <clears throat> Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known, be made known unto God. He's the same thing David says, I cry unto the Lord with my voice here in me. Then in verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you go to God in prayer and you commit those things to God in prayer, God sustains you. He keeps your, your, not only your hearts, but your minds through Christ Jesus. One of the, the main battleground for our spiritual life is in our minds. That's where Satan attacks. We rarely see a lot of external attacks. It's always internally with our minds. Satan warfares on our minds because that's where we do all of our thinking. That's where we make our decisions on things. And Satan will attack to try and discomfort your mind. Romans 8 verse 31. Romans 8 verse 31 tells us something that can help us. When we think of not having peace or things going against us, people, problems. One thing we need to remember as we go to God in prayer, it says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You can have the nastiest person come at you. But if God is, if you believe God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against us. Our God is greater than the greatest enemy. God's greater than Satan. 
God's greater than your family member who gives you a hard time. God's greater than your neighbor. God's greater than your work colleague. God's greater than, than the government. God's greater than, than the richest person in the world who might boast and maybe, and, and maybe against you. So this David who we know was a, did, did many great things and had some great things going, found himself at a very low a point in life where he had to flee, had people problems, and was so discouraged and, and, and so down and, and unsure where to go, turned his mind to God and said, God, this is what I'm going through. Now, now, now God doesn't want us to pray because he doesn't understand or even know. God already knows what's going on. But by us going to God and praying, we're like we're turning it over to him. We're making a, a personal choice to say, God, I need your help. And then when God helps, he says, hey, if I'm for you, no one's going to be able to be against you. Or no one's going to be able to defeat you. He says, I, I can comfort you. I can give you peace. I can give you rest. I can help you with those things. And what I want to finish with is in verse 7 and 8. I want you to notice David's praise. David's praise. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Notice he says, he gives the right thinking towards God. He says, thou hast smitten all mine enemies. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto you, Lord. He starts giving the rightful praise, the rightful thoughts towards God. You know, God has the ability to totally defeat your enemy, totally solve the issues that you're currently facing. He totally does. He totally can, and I believe he totally will, according to his will according to what he needs to do in your life. I will say that just because we pray doesn't mean God's going to remove that thing. God may need that thing to teach you something, to help you mature, to help you grow. But understand that even through that, God can sustain you. God will never leave you nor forsake you, as Hebrews 13, 5 tells us. God has the ability to defeat any, any enemy. And I think as, as, as David thinks about this, he says, hey, you've smitten all my enemies. You've smitten them on the cheekbone. Maybe he thought about when he defeated Goliath. He said, God, you helped me in that. I remember the Goliath. I did the impossible because you helped me. I believed you and you helped me. God, you're great. I don't care who these people are now. You can help me even through these things. Try and give God the recognition and the blessing when God works. It's God that does the saving of people's souls. It's God that, that, that helps us through our life as a Christian. And we need, to God, we need to give God the blessing for all things. Salvation belongeth under the Lord. God's blessing is upon thy people. I believe God's blessing is upon you today. God's blessing is upon your life. The fact that you can meet here in freedom and, and you have the comfort of this church and you have the opportunity to openly open your Bible and you have the opportunity to read the verses yourself. You have the opportunity to find out what God has for you. That's a great blessing. That is, uh, that is God's doing. And the people problems that you face and the things that, that you go through, God can help you through that. And we need to remember to give God the glory. We need to give God the praise. And when, and when we're testifying of what's happened in our lives, we say, God did this. God showed me this. God helped me with this. And I believe God enjoys receiving the glory as we praise Him.
let me encourage you, as you go through things and God does help you or God shows you something through that, testify of it here in church. As testimonies, I think we have testimonies from time to time. I can only say, something happened this weekend, you don't have to air all the dirty things about it, all the bad things, but say, I had a situation this week where I didn't know what to do, I prayed, and guess what? God showed the answer very quickly. Or God allowed me to go through this, and this is what I learned. All glory to God. Salvation belongeth under the Lord. God receives praise. You know what? When you can do that, you're now starting to grow. God is helping you. God is bringing that blessing upon your life. It seems like David was able to turn some of the most troubling times in his life into some of the most joyous times as he learned to rest upon God. And I found that to be true. The times I've stopped, as I mentioned before, as I've stopped floundering around in this situation, and I've said, God, can you help me in this, have been some of the most encouraging times of my whole life. Because I've actually seen God working, uh, taking care of the situation, um, dealing with things outside of my complete that I can't do anything about, and seeing the result and go, oh, I'm so glad I, I took my hands off that. Because if I would have continued in this thing trying to fix it, I would have made it worse and worse till it would have been a complete mess. I'm glad of the promises that God says will never leave us nor forsake us, as I mentioned in Hebrews 13, 5. And I want to encourage you to see God in the hard times that you may be facing now so that you can come through the other side stronger and more mature than you were previously. We do serve a great God. I'm glad for what the Bible records about what people went through. As I mentioned, like, David was a man we would all, uh, in, in certain parts of his life, that we would aspire to be like. We would think, man, if, if we had a David in our midst, who God seemed to just like skyrocket to fame, and there were people here, and we'd be like, whoa! But then to see him so down, and that uh, fearful, and, 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 and afraid of what's going to happen, and then see God work, it would be such an amazing thing. But the same God that David cried unto is the same God that we get to cry unto. And that's the best blessing out of our whole life. Is we get to talk to God, and we get to listen to God, and we know that God hears, and we know that God answers, and we know that God worketh all things well for us. God works for our best at heart. I'm going to leave it there. Hope that was a that was a help for you, an encouragement for you, and a blessing today. So let's pray, and uh, we'll get ready to go and fellowship and lunch and rest. And then I encourage you to come back tonight if you are physically able. Look, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for the things that you've shown me and helped me. And thank you for the opportunity to share today. Pray that you would use your word to help and encourage and, and pray that you would use it and get people thinking more about you and to call that to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But Steve, you can close however you feel fit.
If you want to uh, grab your hymn book, we'll do the last two, uh, the first and the last verse of hymn number 441. Great is thy faithfulness. I'd we'll like to stand. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be dismissed.